where am I coming from? Well, uh, I'm a New Zealander originally. I trained in general surgery. I went into full-time student ministry with the CMF in the Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK back in 1992. Did that for nine years and I was CEO for 18 years. So 27 years with Christian Medical Fellowship, which is a, a group of about four or 5,000 Christian doctors and medical students throughout the UK and Ireland. And then uh, I, I left that three years ago to a new role as the chief exec of a group called the ICMDA, which is the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. And what we do is bring together national associations of Christian doctors and dentists in over 80 countries worldwide. So that's my, my background. This is uh, an issue transgender that I'd never been asked to speak on. We've published on very, very rarely up until about 2016, and then the whole thing burst on the scene. And I think in my last couple of years at the Christian Medical Fellowship, probably half the talks I was giving were on this issue because it was so topical. We're a few years further on now, but we're still very much living with it, and we need to be able to think about it as, as Christians. So I'm, I'm looking at this from different angles, and the first thing I want to do is just look at the phenomenon itself so the transgender moment and its effects. And this was Time magazine in the, in the mid-2010s, uh, the transgender tipping point. And uh, they would taken this idea, tipping point, from Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, that within a society, you reach a point where enough people are bought into a particular idea or ideology that it becomes mainstream. And so when this issue appeared on the front of Time magazine, we knew that something had changed quite dramatically in our society. And then, of course, uh, it was what really hit it off was when a young man uh, called Jenna, uh, who had won a gold medal in the decathlon for the US in the 1978 Olympics, suddenly declared that he was a woman called Caitlin and appeared as Caitlin Jenner on the front page of Vanity Fair magazine. And it was really that moment that that changed the culture on the other side of the Atlantic. And on this side of the Atlantic, we, we saw similar things. One of them, not quite as high, pro high profile, was when Eddie Redmayne, the actor here, played the title role in The Danish Girl about a person who had changed gender early in the 20th century and had all sorts of complications from, from that. And then uh, the rest of society was trying to keep up. So particularly social media, Facebook said, we must address this. Activists were saying, there's not just uh, trends, there's a whole lot of different genders. Facebook started to multiply these. At one point, they had 71 gender options available and it got out of, out of control. And so they opted for man, woman, other as a much more simple alternative. You might say, well, what were these uh, 70 plus options? And some of them are listed here, each of them with their syllables. So you recognize the male and female icons up in the top left-hand corner. But alongside that, there's uh, bi-gender, androgyne, new choice, agender, intergender, demi-boy, demi-girl, and so it goes on and on. I'm just showing you one page of a several-page document here. And so people were arguing there were, some people were saying there were as many genders as there were individuals of the world, that every person had their own gender. And uh, we, we saw changes happening in the medical profession as well. So when I trained, there was a condition called gender identity disorder. It was listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Diseases in, uh, in the year 2000. And it wasn't until the year 2013, and that's only nine years ago, that they changed it. And that signaled a change within thinking among people in the medical profession and they renamed it gender dysphoria. And what that, that change meant was that it shifted the, 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 uh, the emphasis. So before, if a person had gender incongruence, in other words, there was a conflict between what their body said biologically and what they felt or believed themselves to be, that's what gender incongruence is, then uh, it was initially thought that that was a problem, a disorder in itself, mental health disorder. What, what changed was that people said, no, it's, it's a normal variant. It's part of you know, the rainbow diversity of culture, and it's only a problem 
if it causes distress. So that was a very real change. And so we saw in the DSM-5, gender dysphoria, similar changes happened in the ICD-10 and 11, the international uh, classification of diseases. And why, why did this change happen? Well, uh, it, I can tell you it was not because of a huge amount of growing evidence. It was about a very strongly ideologically driven change that there was a tipping point of people who were saying we have to do this. And so uh, it happened. And then we started to see a huge number of increased referrals to gender identity clinics. So this, this is a headline from The Guardian, a British newspaper in uh, 2016. Gender identity clinic services under strain as referral rates soar. And uh, these referrals were coming uh, thick and fast. So you've got the, uh, the red line there as girls, and the blue line as boys. And you can see that there is an exponential increase. And I'm, I'm only showing you there up to 2016-17, but it, it has continued on this uphill trajectory. And the, the very interesting thing is that if we go back uh, 20 years or so, then the vast majority of people with trans were boys. But now the majority are girls, and particularly teenage girls. So, so in other words, girls wanting to change identity of gender to boys were being referred. And a lot of these folk were very young. You can see here that from this bar graph that the, the majority were in the 12 to 17 age group, so teenagers who were being referred to these clinics. But there were uh, it was a long tail of younger children, and it included children as young as three who were saying, you know, mummy, daddy, I'm in the wrong body. And so what happens when people go to these clinics, there's, there's a process that begins, and if it's decided that the diagnosis applies, then they, first of all, change identity. Often that's already happened before referral to, this, to the clinic. So they, they're using different pronouns, they're dressing up differently, they're, they're, they're involved in different kind of behaviors. And then the next step is puberty blockers to stop the secondary sex characteristics of, of puberty happening. And then after that, the hormones from the opposite sex to their biological sex. And then uh, after that, gender reassignment surgery. I won't go into the details of that. And, and so people would go along this pathway, and some would go right to the end of it. Others would stop half, halfway with, with the blockers and the, the hormones, but have no surgery, and so on. But th th there are an increasing number of people going through the whole process. But the thing to appreciate is that there's a this was a hugely new phenomenon that had just arrived on the scene just like that. The church didn't know what to do. This is the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was uh, not clear about it, but uh, clear on one thing is that he did not want to risk offending people. And then uh, we had the Church of England vote overwhelmingly in favor of welcoming transgender people. Of course, it depends what you mean, doesn't it, by welcoming, what that actually means. Does welcoming mean, yes, of course, you know, God loves everybody, everyone's made in the image of God, come into our church and be part of the community? Or does it mean that we affirm everything about your beliefs and what uh, you want to do? There's two different issues there. And then medical change, social change, uh, legal change is inevitable. These kind of changes were taking place everywhere. Again, this is the British example that I'm most familiar with. But a, ha a, a paper was brought to the House of Commons, our lower house of parliament, and uh, the, it brought a whole set of proposals to change the law over the transgender issue. Now, up until this point, you could legally change gender, but and, uh, you could only do it at the age of 18. And so the proposals were that they update the Gender Recognition Act to enable 16 and 17 year olds to do it, to use puberty blockers for children, cross sex hormones for teenagers. All of this was actually happening already, but, but illegal under the law and that, not, that official records like passports and other things would be non-gendered uh, as, as a result. And so there was a great push for change. And this was a headline that most people missed because it was on Christmas Day in 2017 
rethink over new law that would allow adults to swap gender without consulting a doctor after minister gets whole, cold feet over it. And uh, a week later, uh, this Member of Parliament, Justine Greening, a Conservative Member of Parliament in Britain who was championing this whole thing and had the uh, portfolios of both education and women's affairs, so she, in a very, very powerful position socially, uh, she was sacked by the Prime Minister, Theresa May. And no one really knows what's behind it, but we do know that the government was getting very anxious about the speed of change, particularly over this issue and the concerns that were being raised. And up until that point, I would have said that uh, it was all inevitable that we were going to see this change. There was going to be very, very little opposition to it and very few questions raised. So that's the social phenomenon. Let's, let's just think now about where did it all come from? What were its, its roots? Why did it suddenly appear uh, as, it, as it did? And, and of course, the real reason is that it, it was brought to the attention of people in celebrity culture. That's why it became a national uh, issue and an international issue. But if you want to trace this thing philosophically, historically, theologically, and all the rest, then you've got to go back a lot further to see uh, the roots of this, uh, this ideology. And uh, you know, they say what's, what's whispered in the ivory towers of universities in one generation is then shouted in the streets in, in the next. That's how social change takes place. And uh, that's how ideology uh, shapes a nation or an international community. And I recommend these, these two books. I'd have to say, sadly, that a lot of the best stuff on this, on the history, is not written by evangelical Christians. There are, there are some, uh, some good stuff coming now. But a lot of the best stuff is actually written by people who are not evangelical Christians at all. Gabriel Kuby is a Catholic, German. Uh, but you, you won't read a, a, a better history of the sexual revolution, where she goes right back to Romanticism, the Enlightenment, the rise of, of, uh, of uh, the whole sexual revolution, which led eventually to the situation we're in now. So that's a great book to, to buy and read. Douglas Murray, again, not a Christian, but, but not hostile to the Christian faith, sympathetic. The madness of crowds at a kind of more popular sociological level uh, well worth worth reading those. But uh, what were the ideological roots of what was happening? Well, there were three primarily. And the first one was radical feminism. The, the whole idea of uh, which came out of cultural Marxism at the beginning of the 20th century, the whole idea of uh, throwing off the yoke of women. And this is called the third uh, feminist revolution. The, the first one was about uh, giving women the vote. And it's, isn't it appalling how late it took for that to happen? The second one was about liberation of women and enabling women to work in the, in the uh, workforce. We look back at those things now with horror, wondering why we ever tolerated that uh, situation. But the, it's the third revolution, the, the radical feminism, that has raised much more questions. And this whole idea that, that all women uh, living in a situation where they are uh, oppressed and uh, suffer violence from, from men and that uh, they need to throw off the male yoke. And then the second route was this uh, philosophical idea of Gnosticism, which is the idea that John was addressing in his first epistle, uh, 1 John. And uh, that's about the question of how do we know what's real? And, and do we, where do we look to learn what's real and what's true? Uh, do we look to God's revelation, his word, at things external to ourselves, or do we look inside ourselves at our own thoughts and feelings? That was essentially what, uh, one of the things that Gnosticism was, was about. And the idea that, that, that you are not your body, your body's not really part of you, it's, a, it, it's another component and that you've got to liberate the internal, the authentic inner you that's inside. So in other words, that your thoughts and feelings are far more important in determining who you are than any other reference point. And then the third uh, route was queer theory, the idea that gender categories are just social constructs. In other words, the whole idea of male and female is not something that has any biological reality, but it's something 
that we impose upon people by imposing gender roles. And so the whole term of uh, the gender assigned at birth language came from, from that idea. And then that was combined with the narrative power of, uh, of you know, freeing the human spirit from shame and prejudice and hate, and then uh, very, very positive role models, particularly in uh, sitcoms, rom-coms, documentaries, dramas, and in celebrity culture, of people you know, giving very, very powerful personal testimonies that, that, um, that gave currency to the, the new ideology. So Simone de Beauvoir, a radical feminist, very influential. Uh, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Famous quote from, from her. And you see, that this, this raises the question, if a, if a woman is not something you are, but you become, then why can you therefore not become other things that, that don't necessarily match with your biology? So it, it created a change of feeling. But the person who, who really took it forward was the American academic Judith Butler with her book, uh, Gender Trouble, which most people haven't heard of. But she was the one who really popularized this idea of gender being simply a social construct. So queer theory, which she was one of the proponents of, came out of radical feminism with the aim of rupturing the norm of the man-woman binary. So she saw this whole idea that the human beings are divided into two categories, male and female, as something that was had, had been an oppressive idea that had been opposed and needed to be thrown off, ruptured, that we needed to get rid of this norm and create a completely new way of thinking about it. And so her view was that woman and man, those categories, they're just myths. They're not real. They're just social constructs which lead to violence and oppression. And so the, the, the whole word queer uh, comes from the, it's a, it's a verb, queering is an action. And what queering means is that you, you undermine, shake, and overturn the existing order. So uh, it, it's the, the, this idea of the man-woman binary that men and women are distinctive categories had to be overturned and uh, destroyed. So those are the, the, the philosophical roots and uh, there's another book I'll mention later which goes back into much more detail and traces the ideas back to romanticism and the enlightenment and so on. So uh, what's happened since? Well, we've moved and it's different in each country of the world. It'll be different in each country in Europe as well. But we've moved from a situation where uh, there were no contrary voices at all, and it seemed that the whole world was going along with this new ideology, to a situation where suddenly there is a huge number of gender-critical voices. In other words, groups of people who are very unhappy with the whole new way of thinking. And uh, if we go back a few years, it was very hard to identify anyone in that category who wasn't a Christian believer. But now what's happened is that there are lots of different groups expressing the same ideas who would not normally agree about uh, other things. And uh, I, I was uh, called along to a meeting in Parliament organized by uh, the man in the middle of this picture, David Davies, who was a Welsh member of Parliament. And he had a, a website at his constituency, and he'd expressed on it the view that he was concerned about trans women, the men who become women, using women's lavatories, and that, that raised issues that were important that we needed to talk about. And then he came under attack from the transgender lobby, who tried to get his website cut down, who, who was saying all things about him. And uh, he said, uh, he was the wrong guy to take on because he said, I don't like this. This is something we need to talk about. And so he organized a meeting and he invited a lot of us along to it in Parliament. But he, he, he said, I don't want any Christians on the panel. I want, I want people on the panel who are concerned about this, but who are not coming from a faith perspective. He wasn't anti-Christian himself, but he was just wanting to attract a very wide audience to it. And so the four people he, he got were um, a woman who heads up a group called Transgender Trend, which is a support group for the parents of gender-conflicted children. So all, all these parents whose children you know, are wanting to change gender, they were very unhappy about it. They didn't have any support, so they got together. She was the leader of that group. And then the second woman on the left was a woman called Judith Green, 
who was from a woman's refuge. And she was, she was concerned about the fact that they needed to protect safe spaces for women and that trans women were coming in and there'd been cases of abuse and sexual <coughs> molestation. She said, this is an important issue. And then the chap to the right of, of um, David Davis, the MP, was uh, a psychologist called James Caspian at a British university. And he'd had a, a number of people who'd come to him who'd had trans hormones and surgery and were very, very unhappy with the results and wanted to change back into their original gender. And, and they're wanting his help. And so he applied for funding from his university to do some research on what he called detransitioning. And, and the university uh, refused to fund it because it was politically incorrect research. And so he was concerned about this. And then uh, the, the, the fourth one there is uh, a, a trans woman called Miranda Yardley. Uh, so uh, biologically male, but now identifying as a trans woman. And uh, uh, he or she was really unhappy with the, where the whole ideology was going. And he, he, was, he was saying, look, I, I'm a trans person, but I'm really unhappy about transgender ideology and the way it's being imposed. So suddenly we had all these people who were concerned about the, uh, about the change. And so the things that were changing the tide was, was first of all, we had opposition from feminist groups. Now, these feminist groups, there was, a, there was a case in Hyde Park in, uh, in the UK where a group of feminists was attacked by a group of trans women uh, who were calling them uh, abusive terms, TERFs, trans, T-E-R-F, trans um, equality, no, what's the word? Trans Trans-exclusionary radical feminists, TERFs. And, and these, uh, these feminists have been beaten up by these trans women. And then there was concern uh, from uh, feminist groups who were saying, well, we don't think trans women are real women because they haven't been through what we've been through as girls and so on. So, so they don't know what it is to be a woman. How, how can they be like us? And then uh, there were lesbian groups who are also concerned about this because, and we'll come, we'll come, to, that, we'll come to that later. I'll, I'll illustrate why that is. Stories of violence and abuse by trans women in prisons and hospitals. You know, just, just anecdotal but real stories uh, in low numbers, but enough to raise concerns. Concerns about the undermining of civil liberties, so that if I've got a, a right to change my gender, that of course means that other people then have responsibilities you know, to use the pronouns I want to treat me in a certain way to allow me to use facilities or whatever. So there were concerns from civil liberties groups, has this gone too far? And then there was th this data that was coming through about uh, cessation, first of all. So cessation is the idea that, that um, if you take the children who identify as trans and follow them up without intervention, then between 80 and 90% of them will cease to want to change gender and will uh, relate with the, in other words, for a number of them, it, it is a kind of growth stage, if, if you like. And then detransitioning, I've mentioned. And the other thing that was raising concern was what's called ROGD, which is rapid onset gender dysphoria in women. So these are uh, groups of teenage girls together who were wanting to become uh, boys. Then there were concerns about children having transgender treatments. Has this been tested? Do we know the long-term effects of puberty blockers and all of that stuff? And then uh, there were medical facts starting to emerge about the causes and effects of gender dysphoria. That's the summary. Let's unpack that in a bit more detail. So this is lesbian women saying, we're being pressurized into sex by trans women. So they were saying, we want to, we're lesbians, we want to have sex with real women, not with men with women who are biologically male and have XY chromosomes and may even still have male genitalia having not had surgery. And uh, they were being accused of being transphobic because they were unhappy in having sex with trans women. And then uh, this is the sex change regret. So the Caspian story of uh, the psychologist who was having people coming saying, look, I'm, I've had all this done and I'm still really unhappy and I want to change back. This was in PLOS One, which is a peer-reviewed journal. Parent reports of adolescents and young adults perceived to show signs of a rapid onset of gender dysphoria. So it's talking about this ROGD phenomenon. And you might not be able to read that 
uh, abstract, but let me just read the first few lines of it. In online forums, parents have reported that their children seem to experience a sudden or rapid onset of gender dysphoria appearing for the first time during puberty or even after its completion. Parents describe that the onset of gender dysphoria seemed to occur in the context of belonging to a peer group where one, multiple, or even all of the friends have become gender dysphoric and transgender identified during the same time frame. Parents also reported that their children exhibited an increase in social media and internet use prior to disclosure of a transgender identity. And, and so it goes on. Recently, clinicians have reported that post-puberty presentations of gender dysphoria in natal females and girls that appear to be rapid in onset is a phenomenon that they are seeing more and more in their clinic. So, on. so th this is the concern. Why was it in the past mainly boys? Now it's mainly girls. But more than that, it's happening in peer groups of girls who know each other and are in the same class. Is this something more than a biological phenomenon? And... Uh, then there were governments pushing for more uh, liberal laws on this. There's, this is the Scottish government, which has been uh, more extreme on this than the British government or the English government at Westminster. So one of the headlines here, Scotland will let pupils change gender age four, uh, but read without their parents' consent. So uh, for, for the first stage ever, a, a, a change which had always been seen as something that should be under the, the uh, oversight of the medical profession was happening with children of four uh, who, who could not understand or give consent to what was, was happening. And so there was concern about that. Uh, some of you will remember Germaine Greer. Uh, I remember when I was a, uh, a teenager, when I was a university student, she was a feminist icon who was known worldwide. She's since become an MP. This is petition urges Cardiff University to cancel Germaine Greer lecture. So she went to speak at, at the capital city of Wales and the university there, and she was no-platformed, which meant that uh, people complained that what she was saying was offensive because she said that trans women were not real women like us. And so the way they dealt with that is to say, let's just take away her speaking rights at all. She's not allowed to speak here. And what was very strange about this, that was here was a woman who was really on the radical extreme uh, 30 or 40 years ago, and, and now... Uh, is, is so much kind of mainstream that she's being uh, denied a platform by the radical extreme. So another uh, indication of how the culture had moved. And then, of course, the court cases. So we had um, uh, Joe Biden was wanting to push a transgender mandate on this. It was challenged in the courts and blocked. Uh, Maya Forstatter was a British woman who, who uh, gave a tweet um, saying that uh, she didn't think trans women were real women, and she lost her job over this, and then she went to court and won the case, but then it's been appealed in higher courts. And then uh, this, there was this case of a woman who had had uh, transgender hormones and wanted to uh, reverse uh, the whole thing, going to court, and then uh, there was a high court ruling which placed puberty blockers um, uh, I mean, the, the story here was that, that, that it was argued children under 16 shouldn't be able to give consent for a, a medical procedure that they can't properly understand. And the court actually backed that up, said, no, it shouldn't happen. But then, of course, that's being appealed, so it's being uh, reported the other way here, that that ruling was based on partisan evidence. And so you, you can see very strong ideological commitments on both sides. And then at the moment now we're in, in Britain in a situation where uh, there's a big inquiry going on into this uh, massive spike in trans referrals. You know, why is it that thousands and thousands of kids are, are going to clinics and getting treatment for something that was never recognized as a problem 10 or 15 years ago? So we've looked at the transgender moment. We've looked at the, the roots of it ideologically. We've now looked at the, the growing gender critical movement which is across a broad spectrum of people who don't agree about other things together, but are united about the fact that they're very concerned about what's happening with transgender ideology. So let's look now at the, at the medical facts. And uh, this was a, a report that came out in the New Atlantis in the US, 143 pages, uh, 
I can't remember the exact date, 2016 was, but the conclusion here, examining research from the biological, psychological, and social sciences, this report shows that some of the most frequently heard claims about sexuality and gender are not supported by the scientific evidence. And we're, we're going to unpack that a bit more looking at specifics. But, but the key message to get is that when you look at doctors, psychologists, they are divided over this issue. So you, you may be uh, getting the idea from the media that everyone thinks the same amongst psychologists and doctors. It's certainly not true. There is a big division of opinion. So uh, one of the questions was about, have we really done long-term follow-up? How, how effective do we know that puberty blockers are, that hormones are? What are the effects of these on things like heart disease and fertility and weight and diabetes and all, you know, we just don't know these things because we haven't followed them up for long enough to, to be sure. And so why are we embarking upon this wholesale medical experiment when in any other field of medicine you would need reams of controlled trials before you uh, allowed drugs to be used for an intervention? And then the next slides here, I've taken uh, a number of these from presentation by Laura Haynes, who is a uh, American psychologist who's an expert in this area, but uh, just addressing these questions. Is the trans identity biological? I mean, is it something that's determined by our genes? And that's a, a great question. And the, the conclusion here, we've got 14 professional organizations and at least 10 endocrine societies agree that transgender identity has social environmental Causes. So in other words, this is not, not something about nature, it's something about nurture. It's not something about genes, it's something about environment that's uh, important. It's not just biologically caused. Or, although there may be uh, some associations with certain uh, genes that give a predisposition, make it more likely that someone would uh, go this way. But it's, it's not, you're not born that way. And of course, the key question about genetics is to say, well, what happens in identical twins who have exactly the same genes? Now, if, if transgender was, was uh, genetically determined, then all twins would be either both trans or both not, wouldn't they? So are they? No, they're not. In fact, the, the concordance rate is 28% only. So in other words, in the majority of cases, the, the twins are different. So if one is trans, it's far more likely the other one will not be. So again, that pours doubt on the uh, biological link. And then the, the, this other concern was uh, psychiatrists and uh, psychologists saying, look, there are, there are a disproportionate number of children presenting with transgender who, are, who have other, medic, uh, other mental health issues going on. And it's, it's very complicated, by no means all, but for example, as this, as this uh, report indicates, there is a, an association with autism. In other words, that more transgender kids are autistic than uh, kids in the general population. The next thing, you know, we, we're told that, that, we're told this with, with homosexuality as well, that it's biologically fixed and determined and it doesn't change over time. Uh, of course, that's, that's not true uh, either. But uh, gender dysphoria also changes over time. So uh, it can fluctuate over many years. The feelings can be strong or strong, or they can weaken and, and so on. And as we see, the majority of, of children don't uh, or cease rather than go on. This is another study. The prevalence of psychiatric disorders lifetime for gender non-congruent children and adolescents before the first medical evidence of the gender non-congruence was far higher than for peers who accept and identify with their sex. So in other words, kids who end up identifying as transgender, if you look back at their past lives, they have a much higher incidence of certain mental health issues. So in other words, uh, it's not saying there's a causative link here, it's just saying that there is an association that needs uh, looking into. This is a Finnish study uh, 75% of people uh, who were applying for sex reassignment ser services 
had psychiatric treatment for reasons other than gender dysphoria during their lifetime. That severe psychopathology preceding onset of gender dysphoria was common. Now again, we're not saying this happens in every individual, but we're saying if you look at this group as a population, it's a, a much bigger issue. So they say the recorded comorbid disorders were thus severe and could seldom be considered secondary to gender dysphoria. In other words, you know, because they appeared long before the gender dysphoria appeared, you couldn't say that the gender dysphoria caused it or that it was a result of how they'd been treated because they were transgender. It was there before this came along. So you couldn't argue, well, you know, these kids have been treated and marginalized and this is why they have mental health problems. They preceded these uh, things. And then six months before gender discordance was diagnosed, depression was uh, 23 to 24 times higher in children. Uh, suicidal ideation, 45 to 54 times higher. Self-inflicted injuries were up to 70 to 140 times higher. Again, not saying this does not happen to all. This is a population study, but it's looking at the, the groups and comparing them. 57% have been significantly bullied at school, 92% of these before any gender incongruence. 49% have been persistently bullied before gender incongruence, that bullying was associated with peer isolation, anxiety, depression, <coughs> self-harm, suicidal preoccupation, and so on. So all, all of this is saying is not that, that gender incongruence causes mental health problems, other mental health problems, or other mental health problems cause gender incongruence. It's not, they're not saying, it's just saying there's an association between the two, but the level of mental health problems in kids with gender incongruence is much higher than in the general population. And there are associations with things like autism. Now, if you, if you hear that as a doctor, then you're saying, hang on, this is much more complex than we thought. And before embarking on treatment programs, we should be trying to work out exactly what's going on in these kids in all parts of their lives. And even if you have no problem with, uh, with uh, hormones and puberty blockers and surgery for some, then at least you have an obligation to make sure that you've really got the right diagnosis at the beginning. So you know, we, ha we have this aphorism in medicine, no treatment without diagnosis. Particularly this is dear to my heart as a, as a surgeon. You, know, you, you need to know what you're doing before you do an operation. And so we should be applying the same procedure. You don't give antibiotics to a diabetic. You don't give heart failure pills to someone with, with uh, you know, a gangrenous foot or something. You've got to give the right treatment for the right diagnosis. So you have to know what's happening first. And so this was the recommendation from the, the Finnish studies that treatment should aim to reduce or resolve gender dysphoria by aiming to reduce or resolve predisposing factors and that the first-line treatment includes treatment of possible comorbid, comorbid disorders, in other words, other things that are happening in the child that may predispose a young person to the onset of gender dysphoria. So that's all mental health issues. What, what, about, uh, what about physical problems? What sort of evidence is there there? Does uh, giving hormones to people for transgender treatment alter their physical outcomes in terms of other diseases. And this is a, uh, this is a Swedish study, and you possibly can't read the, the things here, but the things that are framed there are the SIRs, which are the standard incident ratios for various other diseases that you get in people who've had hormone treatment as opposed to those who haven't. And uh, for stroke in trans women, it's 2.4, which means you're, t you're you're two and a half times more likely to have a stroke if, you, if you're a trans woman who's had hormone treatment than if you haven't had hormone treatment. Uh, for, the, for heart attacks, myocardial infarction, 2.6 times. For venous thromboembolism, that's clots in the leg, 5.5 times. So there's certainly an effect, uh, side effects of hormone treatment. For trans men, so women who've tra uh, uh, transitioned to men, it's uh, 1.7 times for stroke, which is lower than in, in trans women, 
but in heart attacks it's 3.7, which is higher than in trans women. So the, the, the point is, hormone treatments have physical side effects that are important if you're giving a, an intervention. And it was on the basis of this, this is the Karolinska University in, in Sweden, which is saying that they were stopping all new hormone treatment in children with gender dysphoria due to the lack of evidence of its effectiveness. The recommendation was to use it only in randomized trials. So again, th this isn't an ideological objection. It was a medical objection. It, it was basically saying, look, we shouldn't be using a treatment until we've got more evidence, A, that it works, and B, that there aren't significant side effects. And so we're going to go on giving these hormones, but only in randomized trials to a few children. We're not going to make them available wholesale, which uh, I think whatever a person's view uh, on this issue, you'd have to say is, is sensible from a medical point of view. So uh, <coughs> let's just um, think where we're at now in terms of focusing on the key question. And I think there is one really important key question in all of this. And it's this, is a person with, with gender dysphoria, gender identity disorder, whatever you call it, incongruence between their beliefs and their body, is a person in that condition really a man in a woman's body or vice versa? Is that what they really are or are they just a woman with a false belief that they're a man? or a man with a false belief that they are a woman? That's the key question. Now, uh, 20 years ago, most doctors would have bought into the second one, that this is, this is a, a case of disordered thinking, and that that's how to manage it. And of course, uh, th what you think about it will determine the kind of treatments that you think are effective. So if you think that a trans person is a woman in a man's body or whatever, and that their real identity is the opposite biological sex, then you're going to be changing the body, aren't you, to match the beliefs or the feelings. That's what you're going to do. But if you think the other way, then you're going to, you're going to say, no, we've got to help this person to be reconciled in their beliefs to the biological reality of their body, you see? And that's the key question at the heart of all of this. So do we alter the body to conform to the beliefs, or do we try and help the person be reconciled to the beliefs in their body? Uh, and, and recognizing how incredibly difficult that is for, for some, where it's going to be a lifelong struggle. Or, or do we, uh, or, or in that case, should we just support them in their conflicted state, uh, you know, with, with gr great compassion and support, uh, or do we uh, go down the medical pathway uh, route? And so uh, uh, another way of putting it, is transgender just a normal variant? Are there many different genders that are all perfectly part of the normal spectrum that we should just see as the, the, the colorful diversity of the universe? Or is it actually uh, what we would call a body dysmorphia a, a, a mental disorder characterized by an obsessive preoccupation that some aspect of one's own appearance is severely flawed and warrants exceptional measures to hide or fix it. You know, so is, is it like the person, or the, like the teenager who's really unhappy with the shape of their chest or their, you know, the, the look of their ears or you know, the, 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 you know, their arms are very thin or whatever, or they've got an abnormal rib cage and, and they want changes or they want plastic surgery because their nose is too... Is it, is it a body dysmorphia like that where a person's unhappy with their body? Uh, and Or the other question is, 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 it, is it a bit like anorexia nervosa? Now, with anorexia nervosa, you have a, a person, more commonly a woman, who has a belief that they are overweight. And so they're, they're dieting, trying to get thinner and thinner. And yet, uh, if, you, if you look at them objectively, you say, no, they're not overweight, they're actually uh, uh, thinner, and we're concerned about their, their weight and that they'll do real damage to themselves because of the physical effects it's going to have. And the question is, you know, what do we do with that belief about the body? Well, we say, no, the person is mistaken in their belief about how uh, overweight they are. 
we don't say as doctors, how can, or, how can we help you? Can we offer you dieting advice uh, to, so that you can eat less and lose weight? Or, or do we say, can we give you um, some kind of surgical procedure to reduce the amount of fat in your, your body? Do we do that? No, we don't do that. We, we, we treat it in a different way. And yet, it, it does seem like transgender is in this kind of category. So why are we managing it very differently? That's the, the question it, it raises. And uh, we're, getting, we're getting near the end now. But uh, I, I th my own view is that a lot of this is about personality. And the fact that if you look at the female population and the male population, there is a huge amount of diversity in both those populations when it comes to personality, uh, giftedness, interests, all of those sorts of things. So, you know, more boys want to become particle physicists than girls, for example. Uh, more boys want to join the army than girls. Uh, more boys want to drive articulated lorries than girls, and so on. And, and then there are other professions where, where you, you find more women. Uh, but there's a huge uh, variation, because there are many girls who, have, who really want to join the army and, and drive uh, articulated lorries and, and motorbikes and, and, and sort of things that you might say were more male occupations, uh, and, and vice versa as well. And so what we've got is... If you look at personality, we've got two overlapping natural uh, 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 normal distributions here. And so the blue one is boys and the pink one is girls. And you can see there's a great deal of overlap in the middle. So the point is this, that the, the female who's here, who is at, at the sort of 95th percentile of all females, so much more kind of male identified in her personality, is she's going to be more male-like than actually the majority of boys. And then the boy who's here is going to be more female-like than in, in their interests uh, than most girls are. And so what we're really looking at is that actually God has created us with a wonderful degree of diversity and personality and gifting. And even though the two populations of girls and boys don't overlap, they're not exactly the same, but there's a huge amount of variation in both. And, and so my question is, are we actually uh, confusing two issues? One is personality, which is actually very diverse, and the other is sexuality or gender, which is not. And, and is it the fact, has, is the fact that we have, uh, we have, uh, forced people into certain gender roles contributed to that. You know, the way we bring up children, that as a little boy, you must have these sorts of toys and interests. Little girl, you must have these. But daddy, I'm not like that. You know, I want to play with the, 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 uh, the boys, you know, and the rough and tumble games. But daddy, I'm not like that. I want to, I want to be with the girls who, who like dressing up and cooking and all that sort of stuff. And, and instead of saying this is part of the diversity that we should celebrate uh, of personality and, and being you know, excited at the different personalities and giftings there are and encouraging people in the gifts and personalities that they have, uh, if we turn around and say, well, you know, the reason you feel like this is actually that you are a girl in a boy's body or, or vice versa. Is that what we're confusing? And I, I would put it to you, I think that that's at least part of the problem. So... Uh, we haven't said anything about the Christian faith yet at all, and, and I'm not going to say a huge amount about it, but I want to just, uh, in closing, talk about um, Christian responses. And I think the first thing is this, that we have to, uh, to recognize that we're dealing with two distinct identities here. And the first one is what uh, was called transgender ideology, which I'd put it to you as a false belief system, which has come out of radical feminism, Gnosticism, queer theory, and so on, that is profoundly anti-Christian, and it is attempting to shape our culture. 
and it, it is a belief system or a worldview which is, is actually false in many regards and that we should be approaching that by uh, refuting it and being gender critical and saying, hang on, I'm not really onto this for these reasons and giving all the medical reasons for concerns and raising the number of people who are concerned about it. So that's one thing. But there's another entity altogether, gender dysphoria, which is a rare but real and distressing condition that needs to be met with compassionate understanding and appropriate treatment. Because uh, you know, some of the folk who, who uh, have it have suffered desperately, and a lot of them have had very difficult uh, times. And so uh, what we need to do as Christians, I think, is to, to separate the two hats, you know, that you approach an ideology you think is f false in one way, but you approach hurting people in another way. So it, it's about uh, showing love and compassion and welcome, but without buying into the ideology. We need to look at it through the eyes of creation. And, and on the one hand, the Bible is unashamedly binary. God created them in his own image, male and female, he created them. You know? and, and we know, however, at the, that there are over 6,000 genes that are expressed differently in men and women. So men and women are biologically different. They have different body structures, different hormones, different, different uh, uh, chromosomes, uh, and so on. And, and those mean that there are all sorts of differences, not just physical, but behavioral, between men and women as a group, as you would expect. But we also live in a fallen world where, uh, as a result of uh, the fall, uh, sin has affected everything, including our biology, including our mental health, including uh, our thoughts, including our beliefs and behaviors, including the whole world, that there's been a breakdown in, uh, in the ecosystem as well. And so that we approach this all as there for I, you know, there for the grace of God go I, people who are all struggling with the reality of sin in our own lives in so many different ways, that we're all broken people. And therefore, uh, because we live in a fallen world, we should not be in the least surprised that there are phenomena like transgender and uh, intersex, which is where there actually are abnormalities in hormones and chromosomes and so on. Uh, we should expect those things and also recognize that the experience of transgender, this incongruence of feeling that you know, your body and your beliefs don't match up is incredibly distressing and difficult and that full healing may not be possible in this world. It might be something you've struggled with your whole life, even though it, in many it does fluctuate over time. And so the challenge for the church is to be a welcoming, you know, redemptive uh, community where uh, people do not feel judged and they feel uh, accepted as people. Uh, that doesn't mean, therefore, that we buy into every belief everyone in the church, everyone who comes to the church has, but we welcome them as special creations made in the image of God. So on the one hand, we've, we mustn't capitulate to transgender ideology and, and loving transgender people does, whether they're Christians or not, does not mean uh, affirming their beliefs if they have bought into transgender ideology. We should seek, I would argue, to support people in their birth sex. And, but we've also got to see that there are, there are gospel opportunities here, that God calls all of us to repentance and faith, that the repentance process involves lots of changes, and that he gives us the power to face all that life throws at us, whilst recognizing that healing might not be possible and that our true identity is in, in Christ as Christians, first and foremost, not our occupations or our personalities or our biology or what we might identify with in terms of gender. So some stuff uh, to read. These are articles that are published in Christian Medical Fellowship. I think this is probably the best book on transgender by Ryan Anderson. You can't get it anymore on Amazon. You have to search hard for it. Uh, I've met Ryan several times. He's a, he's a great communicator. He's, he's writing from a Catholic perspective, but um, it, it's a fantastic book and it's been removed because it's hate speech, supposedly. Uh, this is the book I'd recommend from an evangelical perspective. It just came out last year, I think it was. Uh, it's, it's quite a tough read, 
but it's the equivalent of Kuby's book from a Catholic perspective. To here's someone who's, who's really, who knows the theology, who goes deeply into the history and has a great grasp of it. So I'd really encourage people to read The Rise and Triumph and the Modern Self if you want to um, get into the subject. And then ICMDA, we have various webinars that are all up on our website at icmda.net. Gospel Coalition's got some good stuff and so on.